this week we're cracking open two pieces from way back in the 1920s. First up, Ancient and Modern Initiation. We begin this week with a look at Max Heindel's work explaining initiation, rites and rituals throughout history. The first in a multi-part series will tackle the ideas of the Atlantean Mystery Temple, the Tabernacle in the Wilderness, and some of its various parts. Then we're going to demystify Santa Claus, or perhaps we're going to remystify Santa Claus. What is Santa Claus's occult significance? Spoiler alert, it's not what you think. Make sure your little elves are not around for this one. All this and more coming right up. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Welcome back to the show. This is episode number 475. As we get started, let's go ahead and give a shout out to our contributors, our fellows, and our producers. Without you, we could not complete this show and offer it up every single week of the year since 2011. We're coming up on 10 years, you guys. So just a huge thanks goes out to you. If you are sitting out there and you're listening to this podcast on your way to the office, if you're still going in, or you're working out, or just have it on in the background while cleaning your room, or your kitchen, doing the dishes, or maybe this is all you're doing. Regardless of how you're consuming this, if you're thinking, hey, how can I make sure that Masonic education gets pushed forward and fills this giant void that is out there in Masonic education? How can I help? This is how you can help. We have four levels on Patreon on how you can support the show. You can be a contributor. For that, we put your name up on the website. You are immortalized forever on the interwebs. If you're a fellow, that's a $5 a month contribution. For that, you'll get your name on the site as well as a thank you card in the mail from me. If you're a producer of the program, for that, you get everything we just mentioned. Plus, I'm going to send you a producer's pin, the limited edition Whence Came You Masonic lapel pin. We also have the legacy partner option, which enables you to fully direct an entire episode of the show each year that you are a legacy partner. You'll work with me. We'll be on the phone. We're going to be doing some Zoom meets. We're going to pick out the articles we want. It's going to be a great opportunity to work with each other to come up with the episode that you really want to share with the world. However you are interested in making that work, we have options for you. And just for even considering it, I want to thank you. Now, I mentioned that we do Masonic education every week of the year. That's right. For the last several years, we have 50 episodes a year. That's 50 podcasts. Now, the last two weeks of the year, or perhaps the last week of the year and the first week of the next year, we go, we do go dark for two weeks. So next week's episode is the last episode until 2021. Next week in the bonus features, I'm going to put one of my favorite Masonic books in PDF form, completely OCR'd so that you can search it in Side the podcast app as a download just for all, all of our listeners using the app. If you are supporting us on Patreon, I am going to drop another link inside the message board on Patreon and share with you another Masonic book in PDF and OCR just for you guys. If you're supporting us on PayPal, be ready to get an email with that same information that I'm posting on Patreon. My little gift to you guys as a thank you for constant help and contribution to the show. Oh, and I almost forgot, we added a little something cool to those contributors, fellows, producers, and legacy partners. We've actually launched a new Facebook group, Craftsman Plus. The Craftsman Plus group is really designed to discuss the questions that we come up with within the show and it is only for the supporters of the program. So if you're out there, if you're a contributor, a fellow, a producer, a legacy partner, and you want to be in that Facebook group, find it, Craftsman Plus, the little plus sign, or you can write plus, search it up on Facebook, click join, I'll see it, and I will let you in. Real quick, before I jump into the amazing education this week, 
I get a lot of requests. They say, Robert, really, I'm really interested in those three lectures you do, those quantum lectures. Where can we see those? Well, the first three, the the Esoterics 101, Tetragrammaton, and Quantum Entanglement, and Apotheosis, are available online. I've kind of got them all archived on a website called truthquantum.com. If you go there, it'll say coming soon, but scroll down, you'll see those videos, and they they operate through Vimeo, but it's just a place that houses them all in one neat order so that you can bounce from one to the next. All right, this week, as you heard at the top of the show, we've got some really interesting stuff to cover, and I wanted to cover things this week that were a little bit more esoteric. We've taken a break from a lot of the esoteric stuff recently, and we've dove into the incredible world of marketing and real-world expertise in Freemasonry. You know, when, when we look at Freemasonry like a business or administrative qualities or leadership and all of these things, but I want to dive into something a little bit older. So, I have decided over the next several weeks, we will be tackling a text by the great Max Heindel. Name sound familiar? I hope so. If not, check the show notes for a little backstory on Max Heindel. We're going to read a 50-page paper over the next several weeks from Max Heindel. We'll try to give a little bit each week as we go. There may be some weeks where we take a break and come back to it, but Ideally, what I would love to do is get through this whole thing similar to what we did a few weeks ago when we broke up a really long paper. So let's get started. Ancient and Modern Initiation by Max Heindel. Part 1. The Tabernacle in the Wilderness. Chapter 1. The Atlantean Mystery Temple. Ever since mankind, the prodigal spirit sons of our Father in Heaven, wandered into the wilderness of the world, and fed upon the husks of its pleasures, which starve the body. There has been within man's heart a soundless voice urging him to return, but most men are so engrossed in material interests that they hear it not. The mystic mason who has heard this inner voice feels impelled by an inner urge to seek for the lost word, to build a house of God, a temple of the Spirit, where he may meet the Father face to face and answer his call. Nor is he dependent upon his own resources in this quest, for our Father in Heaven has himself prepared a way, marked with guideposts which will lead us to him if we follow. But as we have forgotten the divine word, and would be unable now to comprehend its meaning, the Father speaks to us in the language of symbolism, which both hides and reveals the spiritual truths we must understand before we can come to him. Just as we give to our children picture books which reveal to their nascent minds intellectual concepts which they could not otherwise understand, so also each God-given symbol has a deep meaning which could not be learned without that symbol. God is spirit and must be worshipped in spirit. It is therefore strictly forbidden to make a material likeness of him, for nothing we could make would convey an adequate idea. But as we hail the flag of our country with joy and enthusiasm, because it awakens in our breasts the tenderest feelings for home, our loved ones, because it stirs our noblest impulse, because it is a symbol of all things which we hold dear, so also so different divine symbols which have been given to mankind from time to time that speak to that forum of truth which is within our hearts, and awaken our consciousness to divine ideas entirely beyond words. Therefore, symbolism, which has played an all-important part of our past evolution, is still a prime necessity in our spiritual development, hence the advisability of studying it with our intellects and our hearts. It is obvious that our mental attitude today depends on how we thought yesterday. Also, that our present condition and circumstances depend on how we worked or shirked in the past. Every new thought or idea which comes to us we view in the light of our previous existence, and thus we see that our present and future are determined by our previous living. Similarly, the path of spiritual endeavor which we have hewn out for ourselves in past existences determines our present attitude, 
and the way we must go to attain our aspirations. Therefore, we can gain no true perspective of our future development unless we first familiarize ourselves with the past. It is in recognition of this fact that modern masonry harks back to the Temple of Solomon. That is very well as far as it goes, but in order to gain the fullest perspective, we must also take into consideration the ancient Atlantean Mystery Temple, the tabernacle in the wilderness. We must understand the relative importance of that tabernacle, also of the first and second temples, for there were vital differences between them, each fraught with cosmic significance, and within them all was the foreshadowing of the cross, sprinkled with blood, which was turned to roses. The Tabernacle in the Wilderness We read in the Bible the story of how Noah and a remnant of his people with him were saved from the flood and formed the nucleus of the humanity of the Rainbow Age in which we now live. It is also stated that Moses led his people out of Egypt, the land of the bull, Taurus, through waters which engulfed their enemies and set them free as a chosen people to worship the Lamb, Ares, into which sign the sun had been then entered by procession of the equinox. These two narratives relate to one and the same incident, namely the emergence of infant humanity from the doomed continent of Atlantis into the present age of alternating cycles where summer and winter, day and night, ebb and flow follow each other. As humanity had then just become endowed with mind, they began to realize the loss of the spiritual sight which they had hitherto possessed, and they developed a yearning for the spirit world and their divine guides, which remain to this day, for humanity has never ceased to mourn their loss. Therefore the ancient Atlantean mystery temple, the tabernacle in the wilderness, was given to them that they might meet the Lord when they had qualified themselves by service and subjugation of the lower nature by the higher self. Being designed by Jehovah, it was the embodiment of the great cosmic truths hidden by a veil of symbolism which spoke to the inner or higher self. In the first place, it is worthy of notice that the divinely designed tabernacle was given to a chosen people who were to build it from free will offerings given out of the fullness of their hearts. Herein is a particular lesson for the divine pattern of the path of progress is never given to anyone who has not first made a covenant with God that he will serve him and is willing to offer up his heart's blood in a life of service without self-seeking. The term Mason is derived from free Mason, spelled P-H-R-E-E-M-E-S-S-E-N, which is an Egyptian term meaning children of light. In the parlance of masonry, God is spoken of as the grand architect. Arch, A-R-C-H-E, is a Greek word which means primordial substance. Tecton is the Greek name for builder. It is said that Joseph, the father of Jesus, was a carpenter, but the Greek word is tecton, builder. It is also said that Jesus was a tecton, a builder. Thus every true mystic Freemason is a child of the light according to the divine pattern given him by our Father in heaven. To this end, he dedicates his whole heart, soul, and mind. It is, or should be, his aspiration to be greatest in the kingdom of God, and therefore he must be the servant of all. The next point which calls for notice is the location of the temple with respect to the cardinal points and we find that it was laid directly east and west. Thus we see that the path of spiritual progress is the same as the star of empire. It travels from east to west. The aspirant entered at the eastern gate and pushed the path by way of the altar of burnt offerings, the brazen laver, and the holy place to the westernmost part of the tabernacle, where the ark, the greatest symbol of all, was located in the holy of holies. As the wise men of the east followed the Christ star westward to Bethlehem, so does the spiritual center of the civilized world shift farther and farther westward, until today, the crest of the spiritual wave which started in China on the western shores of the Pacific, has now reached the eastern shores of the same ocean, where it is gathering strength to leap once more in its cyclic journey across the waste of waters, to recommence in a far future a new cyclic journey around the earth. The ambulant nature of this tabernacle in the wilderness is therefore an excellent symbolical representation of the fact that man is migratory in his nature 
an eternal pilgrim, ever passing from the shores of time to eternity and back again. As a planet revolves in its cyclic journey around the primary sun, so man, the little world, or microcosm, travels in cyclic circle dance around God, who is the source and goal of all. The great care and attention to detail regarding the construction of the tabernacle in the wilderness shows that something far more exalted than what struck the eye of sense was intended in its construction. Under its earthly and material show there was designed a representation of things heavenly and spiritual, such as should be full of instruction to the candidate for initiation. And should not this reflection excite us to seek an intimate and familiar acquaintance with this ancient sanctuary? Surely it becomes us to consider all parts of its plan with serious, careful, and reverential attention, remembering at every step the heavenly origin of it all, and humbly endeavoring to penetrate through the shadows of its earthly service into the sublime and glorious realities which, according to wisdom of the Spirit, it proposes for our solemn contemplation. In order that we may gain a proper concentration of this sacred place, we must consider the tabernacle itself, its furniture, and its court. The illustration opposite page 33 may assist the student to form a better conception of the arrangement within. The Court of the Tabernacle This was an enclosure which surrounded the tabernacle. Its length was twice its width, and the gate was at the east end. This gate was enclosed by a curtain of blue scarlet and purple fine twined linen, and these colors show us at once the status of this tabernacle in the wilderness. We are taught in the sublime Gospel of John that God is light, and no description or similitude could convey a better conception or one more enlightening to the spiritual mind than these words. When we consider that even the greatest of modern telescopes have failed to find the borders of light, though they penetrate space for millions and millions of miles, it gives us a weak but comprehensive idea of the infinitude of God. We know that this light, which is God, is refracted into three primary colors by the atmosphere surrounding our Earth, blue, yellow, and red. And it is a fact, well known to every occultist, that the ray of the Father is blue, while that of the Son is yellow, and the color of the Holy Spirit's ray is red. Only the strongest and most spiritual ray can hope to penetrate to the seat of consciousness of the life wave embodied in our mineral kingdom. And therefore we find about the mountain ranges the blue ray of the Father reflected back from the barren hillsides and hanging as a haze over canyons and gulches. The yellow ray of the sun mixed with the blue of the Father gives life and vitality to the plant world, which therefore reflects back a green color, for it is incapable of keeping the ray within. But in the animal kingdom, to which unregenerate man belongs anatomically, the three rays are absorbed, and that of the Holy Spirit gives the red color to his flesh and blood. The mixture of the blue and the red is evident in the purple blood, poisoned because sinful, but the yellow is never evident until it manifests as a soul body, the golden wedding garment of the mystic bride of the mystic Christ evolved from within. Thus the colors of the veils of the temple, both at the gate and at the entrance of the tabernacle, show that this structure was designed for a period previous to the time of Christ, for it had only the blue and the scarlet colors of the Father and the Holy Spirit together with their mixture purple. But white is the synthesis of all colors and therefore the yellow Christ ray was hidden in that part of the veil until in the fullness of time Christ should appear to emancipate us from the ordinances that bind and initiate us into the full liberty of sons of God, sons of light, children of light, free mason or mystic masons. Now, that concludes chapter 1. Next week, we'll begin with chapter 2. From this first part of the text, Ancient and Modern Initiation by Max Heindel, it's very clear from the start that this may be diving into some realms of Christian mysticism, as perhaps exhibited in Rosicrucian thought circles. So several things pop out to me. First, that there is an Atlantean mode that comes from before and that perhaps, you know, the propagation of man after the flood is the matter before mind type mindset. 
Man now operates differently. He is completely changed in his dynamic mode of thought. Then they move to the tabernacle in the wilderness. Not necessarily a temple, but a tabernacle, and what it represents. Is it, as Max Heindel points out, the Atlantean mystery temple? Maybe. I'm not entirely sure, but as with anything, a lot of this is a symbol for something else, an idea to help you connect some other element, an archetype of a sense. What I found fascinating has always been the idea of the colors. Now, in this particular piece, we deal with blue for God, yellow for the Christ, and red for the Spirit. So, a somewhat Trinitarian view of these colors. My question for you is whether or not you believe in this narrative or not is not what I'm going to ask. What I want to ask our listeners this week and what will be in the Craftsman Plus is the colors in the veils of the temple are said to have been blue and red. And in that, because the temple happens before the Christ has been born, Jesus of Nazareth is born, Is this indeed symbolic of the birth of the color yellow later in this esoteric system? Does it make sense to you is really what I want to ask. And if so, why? And if not, also why? Remember to keep your answers polite, your discourse polite, and I look forward to reading those in the next week. Now before we move on to the next piece, which I'm really excited to bring you, I just wanted to go ahead and let you know they are doing yet another open enrollment for intellectual linear progression. It's one of the best ways to support this show. The seven liberal arts and sciences encompass so much. Continual learning in a classical sense is really something that we're called to as Freemasons. You know, we talk about in the second degree those liberal arts and sciences. There's a brother, Brother Scott Hambrecht, has created one of the most interesting and engaging ways to really enjoy this program, what we call a great books program. If you've never heard of this kind of a thing, history's greatest books are read like a book club and then discussed with a trained interlocutor. That is, somebody who is asking questions and pulling things out of you and making the discussion move forward. Each month, the program ships a carefully selected edition of one of the great books directly to you. The first book you get is Homer, and it progresses through the works of Plato, Aristotle, Descartes, Shakespeare, all the way through the moderns. Each month you're going to meet in a two-hour video conference to discuss the text with a small community of readers in a Socratic seminar, and the whole program is check-in and reading goal system is, is all tied in, so you actually have a really cool way of checking in and checking things off as you progress through the great books with just three one-hour reading sessions each week. So if you're interested in this, Head on over to WCYPodcast.com, hover over our friends, click on Intellectual Linear Progression, and you will see that we have a link in there. And also, if you use the promo code WCY, you get 25% off. And again, this is benefiting you. It benefits this show, and it helps us out immensely. But really, it's about helping you. And so I hope you guys check it out. Also, on WCYPodcast.com, If you hover over other projects and you click on that, you'll see something at the bottom that says that says Wilmshurst U. That's Wilmshurst University. I'd invite you to click on that and check it out. It's a fictional university, but what if we could make it real? There's a little bit more about that on the website as well. All right. Now, here we go. Perhaps the article you've been waiting for. Back in 1920, Dr. George W. Carey and Inez Yudera Perry wrote a book called God, the Word Made Flesh. They also wrote another book called Wonders of the Human Body, and it was originally published by the Chemistry of Life Company in Los Angeles, California. The book is copyrighted by God in the beginning <laughs> and tells the word and tells about the Word of God without which nor anything was made. Uh, Dedicated, the God in thee, O woman, O man, for thou art God-man. So this is a really interesting book, and there is a chapter which I think you will really be interested in, and that is called The Mystery of Santa Claus 
revealed. So, before we get started reading this, I want to give you just a few moments to excuse your little elves or put in some headphones. Santa Claus. All down the ages, there have been stories of fairies, gnomes, mermaids, nades, and fabled characters galore. The ancient Norsemen, Dutch, Huns, and all the Oriental races possess literature prolific with allegories, parables, and fables built around the wonders and physical and chemical operations of the human body. The birth of the monthly seed is the basis of of the Mother Goose stories and similar tales in all the lands. Santa Claus or Saint Nicholas, the patron saint of seafarers, virgins, and children, is the bearer of gifts to children on Christmas Eve. Of all festivals celebrated over the known world, that held in honor of Santa Claus ranks as first in the hearts of all humanity, old as well as young. This in itself is a most significant fact. It is time that the truth in regard to this age-long custom be made known to the world, time that its real and true significance be understood. Then will it be truly celebrated, for it will have become an inward process, as well as an outward observation. Parents, from time immemorial, have explained to their children that the presents which they found in their stockings when they jumped eagerly from their beds in the morning were placed there by a mysterious person called Santa Claus. No one saw him come, no one saw him leave, but he left unmistakable evidence of his visit. Some children ask many questions in regard to this mysterious person, and when they become too insistent, the ingenuity of parents is sorely taxed to give satisfactory answers. There comes a time, however, when they must have the Santa Claus myth explained to them, and it is then that their deep childlike trust and confidence in their parents receives its first shock. Therefore, they commence to doubt their parents, to question their veracity, and many tears have been shed because, after all, Santa was not truly a person. There is a Santa Claus, it is a psychological fact, and it does secrete the most holy and wonderful gift or substance in the body of every individual. Those who understand it, who receive it in the right spirit, have, quote-unquote, become as little children. As above, so below. As in the macrocosm, the universe, so in the microcosm, man. Can anyone think, for one moment, that the parables, fables, allegories, and myths that have come down to us through the ages have no basic foundation? They, as well as the fast days and feast days, are founded on the great esoteric truths. Otherwise, they would have ceased to be. The great hierarchy that rules the universe see to it that nothing is forgotten that needs to be remembered. Santa Claus, or Saint Claus, is derived from the same root word as claustrum, from which cloister is also derived. Claustrum means a barrier, a covered place, seclusion, cloister is referred to as a place of seclusion, and more especially as a place of seclusion for something holy, something dedicated to divinity. There is a Saint Claus or claustrum within the cerebrum, and whoever gave it that name knew why they did so. The suture of the skull is the point where the bones meet. We can very easily see this place on the head of infants, as the sections are not then drawn closely together and the vibrations of the brain can be both seen and felt. In Sanskrit, this is called the door of Brahm, for it is the aperture through which the ego or spirit leaves the body. It is also the chimney of Santa Claus. The vertebrae as a whole is called the stick of Brahm. Directly underneath the door of Brahm is a triangular shaped body named in physiology the island of Rail. This is the place where John was when he looked back and saw the wonderful vision of the regenerated man in the Isle of Patmos. This island is the central lobe of the cerebrum and is also called the pole. 
Hence, the island of Rail is the North Pole of the body, and is, as we well know, the imperishable sacred land. In Santee's Anatomy of the Brain and Spinal Cord, we find that this island is, quote-unquote, situated in the medial wall of the lateral fissure of the cerebrum, between the frontal and parietal and temporal lobes, whose growth, after the fifth month in utero, gradually covers it over. At the end of the first year of extrauterine life, it is entirely concealed by temporal, parietal, and frontal parts of the operculum, end quote, cover or lid. Thus we see that Mother Nature has taken great pains to conceal this sacred center. Underneath this island and directly in line with the optic thalamus lies the claustrum, but separated from it by yet three other bodies. The claustrum is a thin sheet of isolated gray matter, found just medial to the island of Rail. Santee says, quote, It is a sheet of peculiar gray substance and is made up of fusiform, spindle-shaped cell bodies, end quote. It is from this claustrum that contains yellow substance within its outer grayish exterior. What the wonderful, priceless oil is formed that flows down into the olivary fasciculus, descending with the rubrospinal tract through the reticular formation in the pons and medulla to the lateral column of the spinal cord. It terminates in the gray matter of the spinal cord, probably giving off collaterals to the corresponding nuclei in the brainstem, end quote, Santee. This is the oil, the precious gift, which the Bible speaks, thou anointest my head with oil. And not only is there oil manufactured within this special laboratory of the brain, but there is actually an olive tree, which bears actual olives, so named in anatomy. The two olives are two infinitesimal eminences on either side of the medulla with the pyramid between. They are one half inch in length. It is found well developed only in the higher mammals. They are relay stations between the cerebrum and the cerebellum and between the spinal cord and the cerebellum. This oil is the most sacred substance in the body. It is the quintessence of gold, the gold of Ophir, most truly a rare gift. Globules of oil are found in the vital fluid, and when the prodigal son has wasted the substance, he finds that it takes a long time to replace the deficiency and make good the looted bank account. This wonderful oil is the secret work of the Immaculate Virgin Mary, or Mare, represented by the sign Virgo. In chemistry, we find that sulfate of potassium is the mineral salt which uniting with sulfur and oxygen manufactures the oil. We find that this salt also crystallizes out from the mother liquors of the seawater and salt springs. People born under the sign Virgo, if they have become deficient in this salt, suffer from dryness of the skin and baldness. We can also understand why draining of the vital fluid living in the excess will also produce baldness. If there were no oil in the body, the skin would become harsh and dry. The story of the wise virgins who had their lamps trimmed and filled with oil is given to emphasize the necessity for the presence of the oil in the body, for they cannot go out to meet the bridegroom unless their lamps are burning. The lamp is the lamp thereof. The olives which contain the oil are the reservoirs of the relay stations, and, of course, which furnish the oil for the lamp, the pineal gland at the top of which is the flame or eye. When the kundalini, the serpent fire that lies concealed within the sacral plexus, is awakened, burns up the dross within the spinal cord and reaches the canarium, it sets fire to this oil and thus lights the perpetual lamp which gives the light to the whole house. Santa Claus is thus the giver of the supreme gift in the human body, the oil for the perpetual lamp, the gold of Ophir, the quintessence of richness. A total lack of oil in the body will, in itself, cause death. Santa Claus brings his gifts when the Christ Mass is celebrated. The Greek characters stand for Christ, X-P-I, and the word itself Christ means oil in Greek. The seed is the bread of life, and when anointed with oil, christened and crucified, become the Christ Mass, the bread eaten in the Father's kingdom. Thus we now clearly understand the meaning of Santa Claus and his Christmas visit with gifts to the children. There you have this 
really peculiar look at Santa Claus. Perhaps one of the strangest, not due to the way it talks about certain esoteric concept, but certainly strange in that almost nowhere else have I ever found something esoterically written about Santa Claus. Of course, I have read all of the mythologies and fables around Saint Nick, especially around the holidays, some of which are quite gruesome. However, this book from 1920 outlines several different really interesting and mystic concepts. And I don't think the book is really for everybody because it does bring together concepts that might make some people feel weird or they might really not appreciate what they're reading because it might fly in the face of some religious or philosophical concept that we hold dear. However, an interesting text nonetheless. There are several chapters within the book like Redemption, The Ultimate Goal of Humanity, The Books Rejected by the Council of Nicaea, The Marvelous Story of Joseph and Mary, The Plagues of Egypt and the Human Body, The Wives and Children of Jacob, The Science of Leap Year, Revelation of Hermes, The Secret Doctrine, and even a chapter called The Antichrist. So, Very interesting stuff. You know, a lot of this is based on Christian mysticism and explaining some of those beliefs in quite different ways. My second question for you this week is not necessarily if you believe this allegory, this telling, but within this allegory, what do you think the main takeaway is, aside from Santa Claus being allegorically explained as this oil within the human brain, the oil that lights the lamp. Perhaps this lamp is the pineal gland or something like that. What's your big takeaway? Let's hear what your perspective is. That's it for this week. I want to thank you for joining us one more time. Thanks to our contributors, our fellows, our producers. Without you, we don't make this show. If you want to learn more about how to become a supporter of the WCY podcast, head on over to wcypodcast.com and click on support the show. Under the shop, you're going to see a few things. The producer's pin, the soon to come craftsman journal and pen, the Hello Hiram add-on pin, and uh, a slew of other great items, Masonicon Chicago limited gear that we have, a few pieces left over from our awesome conference that we had. Get a copy of It's Business Time, Adapting a Corporate Path for Freemasonry directly from me on the website. That comes autographed. And you can also find a link to Chris Hodap as the editor of this text called Laudable Pursuit. You may have heard of it. Uh, we made an audiobook of it as a project, and uh, all the proceeds from the sale of Laudable Pursuit audiobook go back to the Indiana Masonic Library and Museum. So I want to thank everybody for checking that out also. And that's it. I hope you guys are having a great time as we lead into the holiday season. Re- remember to continue the mindset of gratefulness and giving, and about giving more than receiving, of course. And uh, I know it's difficult in these times to remain positive but let's try to focus on all the great things that are happening. We've got vaccines around the corner. We'll be back to lodge and back off and go into the movies and stuff soon. What does soon mean? You know, I'm I'm hoping within the next year. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking in the grand scheme of my life, if this is the worst of it, then it's not so bad. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, you can surely email me at wcypodcast at gmail.com and I'll get to those emails just as soon as possible. Thanks again for listening. Again, talk to you all next week. Until then, stay on the level. For Whence Came You, I'm Robert Johnson. Take care. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition.
WCY Media.